Good morning. I'm Kyle Heidi. I teach music and I help coordinate India studies here at ASB. And I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker. As a parent of one of our high school students, Dev Benegal is already a full-fledged member of our ASB community. Outside of ASB, he is known as an award-winning filmmaker, a scriptwriter, a trendsetter for India's independent film scene, and a pioneer in the use of digital technology for picture editing, sound design, and post-production. His first film, English August, is a contemporary classic at the forefront of India cinema's next generation, and the first Indian film ever distributed by Hollywood's 20th Century Fox. His second film, Split Wide Open, is about the water wars that take place right here in Bombay. His films have been shown at dozens of international festivals, won numerous awards. I mean, you know, that's nice. But I'm actually, as a teacher, even more impressed by the fact that Dev is devoted to inspiring young people and helping them tell their stories. He does this through programs like 24 by 7, making movies, where under 24-year-olds are all invited to make and submit a film within a 24-hour period. That could be you. A film that he wrote and directed last year called Road, Movie features an old Chevy used by a traveling cinema crossing the Indian subcontinent with some interesting characters who end up having to show the stories from those old films in order to stay alive. Interestingly, Dev's films have also been crossing continents and finding new audiences in different cultures. His presentation today is entitled Epic Difference, posing the question, what happens when stories travel across continents? Please join me in warmly welcoming Dev Benegal. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> Welcome to TEDx. So, stories. Stories are us. Um, once upon a time, like we just heard, once upon a time, long, long ago, far, far away, in a land, there was once a wizard. These lines sound hokey, right? But what is it about them that captures our minds and our imagination? What is it about us as people that makes us want to stop everything and listen to a good story? Let's for a moment just roll back to the dawn of man. Think of the hunter. Um, <clears throat> in the beginning, before we could write or before we could speak, there was sound. Now, sound on its own doesn't really make sense. So if when the hunter heard the sound of a tiger, he didn't quite know what that was. But when he saw the image, or when he saw the tiger roar and leap at him, he put the two together, and it suddenly made sense. What I'm trying to say is that, that sound and image, the image and the image of the tiger, it created something much more than what the hunter saw. It created a story. It created a story of fear. It created a story of survival. So are you getting this? Sound, image, story, survival. Are you getting it now? Story is survival. 31,000 years ago in the Ice Age, there were a group of people who went and painted on the rocks in France. Why did they do that? Why were they so keen to tell their story? What, why are stories so important? What is it about them? Why do we want to keep telling stories? Now consider this. We're always making stories. Your friends ask you, what did you do on holiday? You went you'll sort of spin a yarn or you'll tell them what you did. We went to see the Taj Mahal. We our car broke down. We arrived 
late. It was too dark. We couldn't see anything. And as we turned to leave, the clouds moved and the moon came. And suddenly we turned back and we saw the Taj Mahal. And it was beautiful. It was stunning. So there you have a story. You have a story which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. A couple at the end of the day asks each other, how was your day? And then they proceed to tell them what happened. Um, your parents, when you come back from school, ask you, uh, how is school? And you say, uh, well, they ask you, what did you do at school? And you say, nothing. And in that one word lies an entire story, which has its beginning, middle, and end. Now consider this, that stories have also been one of our greatest exports. More than spices, more than trade, more than war, more than people, more than products, more than technology, more than software, more than services. The one thing that has traveled the widest and the most has been stories. And, the, and that's the one thing that has shaped our lives all throughout the millennia. Look at the Greek myths. Um, look at the Russian sagas, look at Shakespeare, look at um, <clears throat> Mark Twain, and closer home, for example, in the subcontinent, look at the two Indian epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharat. So today, let me tell you a story. Long, long ago and far, far away, don't you love that opening? Um, a king banished his eldest son and heir apparent, Ram, to the forest for 14 years. In the forest, Ram's wife Sita was abducted by a king with ten heads, Ravan, and taken across the ocean to his kingdom, which is present-day Sri Lanka. Ram enlisted his brother Lakshman and a monkey god Hanuman, and with a band of warriors, which were really animals and monkeys, they crossed the oceans and went to rescue Sita, his wife. There was a battle, Ram defeated Ravan and rescued Sita. So this is a classic tale of a triumph of good over evil. But I was to discover more. I traveled to a, a small town on the banks of the Ganga. Uh, it's called Ramnagar, which literally means Ram's town. And it's across from the city of, of Varanasi. And every year they stage a play there. Now, this is no ordinary production. This is a play on the life of Ram, and it lasts for 30 days. There is no theater where this is performed. There is no stage. Um, there is no proscenium like this one. This play is performed right in the city, in the town. And <clears throat> the town becomes the theater. The town becomes a map of India. So if you have a soccer field or a football field, it becomes the king's court. Um, you have a pond, it becomes the ocean. You have a little orchard, that becomes a forest. And every evening as the sun sets, the actors get together and um, <clears throat> go to these places and they perform. And they act and the audience comes in hundreds and thousands to listen to this story. And when these actors get together, they play these divine characters. They play gods, goddesses, and demons. And as the story moves from one place to another, the actors get up and they walk, and they walk down the streets, and they walk to the next venue or the next location or the next setting, and then they act there. And the audience follows them. So this entire play is not just something where you're sitting and you're watching this, but you're actually a part of this world. You're drawn into this, and you are suddenly taken away into a different world in a different time. So I just had to make a film about this. And for 30 days, I spent my life with gods, goddesses, and demons. Young teenagers would play the lead role. Um, they were taken away to a, a sort of dorm where they were trained to act, and they were hidden from you, from everybody else. Um, <clears throat> and they were trained to be like gods and play the roles of gods and goddesses. And finally, when they were ready for opening night, they were dressed like gods, lifted and carried out like gods, and taken to the place where the play was going to begin. 
There were no microphones, there were no lights, there were men holding flame-lit torches which illuminated the, the actors and the musicians played live. Yet there were thousands who turned up to see this story, to see the show and also be a part of this tale. What's interesting about the, 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 the production is that the play brought together people from across the river and also from different communities. The Hindu priest who was directing the show, he was supervising a Muslim family which was building, these, which was building all the props, the sets, the fireworks, including the really 30-foot high tall effigies which would dot the landscape and lead up to the finale, which was the victory of good over evil. I had to find out more about this. <clears throat> After 30 days, I traveled south and met an old man and his wife who would wander from place to place, performing the same story. There were just two of them. It was a smaller, more intimate production, yet one which still drew large audiences. And there was something about the story which audiences knew. They were com comforted by the story. They, they had heard the telling and the retelling of this, of the myths that they had heard and overheard while they were growing up. But something struck me about that story. The story wasn't quite the same as the one I just heard a few days ago in Ramnagar. Guess what the change was? Darth Vader had become Luke Skywalker. Well, not quite, but the demon king, the one with ten heads, was now the good guy. And the husband and wife were singing about his virtues, his intellect, his intelligence, and how he was a misunderstood character. He'd almost become the Dark Knight. Nobody objected, no one took up arms, they listened, glued to the old couple. It was a story after all. And when I looked east towards Bengal, I read about the poet Michael Madhusudan Dutt, who did not see Ravan and his son who died in the battle as evil or as demons. He saw them as Shakespearean tragic heroes. Now this story, this epic, which started from the north, traveled. From the plains in the north, it went down south, across Sri Lanka, over to Indonesia, through Kampuchea, Malaysia, Myanglao, and finally trailing off into Japan. In Myanglao, people see it as a previous life of Buddha. In Kampuchea, it becomes a non-violent story where the main character re resolves conflicts through non-violence. In Indonesia, the story becomes a part of birth rituals, like a baptism of sorts where performers read out the play over a birth ritual in Old Java. On the border of Malaysia and Thailand, Islamic puppeteers enact this story. They perform it ev almost every day of the year. And the story changes from region to region. In some of them, Ram's brother, Lakshman, becomes the hero. In the others, Ram's wife, Sita, rejects her husband and decides to cho and chooses her own future. These are not versions or adaptations. It's the same story which gets absorbed by cultures and retold. Not once, not twice, but over hundreds and thousands of times. And the story still remains the same. And it continues. It continues as an oral telling, shadow puppet, performances, folk theater, traveling minstrels, tribal ritual dances, theatrical drama, musicals, rock shows, television miniseries, and even films. So that's the power of stories, so much so that we've seen courts of law making judgments on mythical characters, like they really existed. But we've got to realize that these are just stories. These are tales made up, imagined, constructed, and yet we love them. Why? Does it say something about us? Does it say something about our mind? Does it, do they speak about the mysteries of human existence? Or are they a way of extending ourselves and our lives, looking beyond ourselves, a way of sharing a human experience? To me, it points back to the primal response, the roar of the threatening tiger. I often say film directors are liars, and I could probably extend that to writers and storytellers as well. Why? Because they conjure worlds which are beyond our imagination. They play with our minds, and in that lie, they hope to reveal some truths. 
the films that I've made, and let me just talk about some of the stuff that I've done, uh, <clears throat> have been stories of journeys. A young man graduates from university and takes, and takes up a job where he trains to be a civil servant, which the job takes him to a small town in, in the heart of unknown uh, India. And the only friend that he makes there is a frog who enters his bathroom one night. At the end of this year, he realizes he must do something and finally brings water to tribals who've never got water for a year. It's a journey from, from the city to small town India. In the next film, an echo of the same character travels from, the small, from a small town to the metropolis, this case Bombay. And in my latest film, the characters travel from an emerging city to the heart of India. All of these journeys of self-discovery and also a discovery of the complexity of the nation. They're discovering, the characters are discovering their country through the stories it tells. And in all of these, they, they discover a, a humanness, a beauty or appreciation of life around them amidst stark and harsh reality. Um, in a filmmaking program that I run, that Kyle spoke about, 24-7 making movies, Anybody under the age of 24 can participate and make a movie. You're given 24 hours in which you have to write, edit, direct, compose music, and complete the movie. Now, why was I seeking, what was I seeking in this? What was I looking for when I came up with this idea? It was, one, it was a boot camp exercise, a grueling test of a sort of mental and physical skills of an individual, and even even how, no matter how young you are, as the 20th hour approaches, even the youngest of the participants couldn't stand on their feet. But most of all, it was to discover and hear new voices. What are the stories of the new generation? Is storytelling changing? And how? And what are the stories of our future? Has it struck you, one of, has it struck you that the um, journey of these epics and other stories that I've spoken about does not seem to end. They have an infinite quality about them. They could go on and on. So what's the big deal about ends? It comes back to life. We have an end. We know the end. What we don't know is, how will it end? But that's what storytellers are fighting. They don't want ends. They want their stories to continue. They want, it's like, you know, Star Wars part one, two, three, four, and so and ad infinit infinitum. The point about telling stories is that there is no end to them. Stories did not begin with the idea to end them. They were told so they could continue. And I think it's really the storyteller who wanted to keep his job. So he just made sure that every night when he was narrating a story around a campfire, the story wouldn't end so people would keep coming back to listen to it more often every night again and again and again. But more importantly, at the heart of all this, is the way the story is told. It's in the telling of the story. And traveling to different countries with my movies, I found I've met people and I've heard them tell their stories. And in those stories, the one thing that has struck me is a great sense of hope. <clears throat> and there's a great sense in those stories, no matter how fractured and fragmented our lives are, that there, there is a great hope for the future. And listening to those stories, I realized that the one thing about stories is that stories have no borders. They have no countries. They have no ends. Stories are without frontiers. They are sans frontier. Some of you are graduating next year and will be beginning your journey. And at some point, everyone in this school would be doing that. You're beginning your own odyssey in life. And at each stage unknown to you, you'll be telling us a story. It'll have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It'll be about your childhood, your youth, and your twilight years. You've got three acts staring right in front of you. What story are you going to tell? What is your story? And in your story and in your journey are the stories of the past and of our future. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Benegal, for the interesting ideas you set forth about storytelling. Uh, as I hope a few of you know, I'm Sahil Tsu, the junior here at ASB.